How's it going guys? In this video, I'm going to be talking about causation and how can we even begin to try to think if something causes something else because I think it's very easy for us to look at associations and then assume that because two things are associated, there must be causation between these two things. And the reality is that proving causation is a lot harder than just looking at stuff. Um, and so that's where statistics comes into this picture to try to help us do this thing that I want to be very clear about. It adds credence to the notion that, that there is causation between two things. It does not conclude that there is causation. We only add credence to beliefs that there is causation. And so what do I mean by that? So, you know, we, <laughs> we've got a bunch of stories out there. S smoking is a great example of one where you know, people think smoking causes lung cancer. And there's a bunch of data that suggests that there's a strong correlation between people who smoke often and people who get lung cancer. But does that necessarily imply that people who smoke will get lung cancer? And you can't be 100% sure that if someone smokes a pack of cigarettes every day for 20 years that they will get lung cancer because there's examples out there of people who don't get it. And so people live to be 100 years old, no lung cancer, smoked a pack of cigarettes every day for the whole for their entire life and they're perfectly fine. And then you get people who've never even smoked cigarettes who also get lung cancer. So it's a really challenging thing to kind of grapple with, especially for me philosophically in terms of, you know, how do you, if you wanted to say something about the world that you're looking at, how do you say that there's causation between two things that you're studying? So two variables. And so the, key thing to note here with, you know, the way statistics tells us to look at the world is to start by conducting randomized controlled experiments. So what does randomized mean? So randomized means that if we were going to conduct some kind of experiment, you would have no idea whether or not you would be put into the placebo group, which is the group that gets nothing, or, you know, a sugar pill that makes you think, oh, or, you know, you're the group that doesn't smoke at all, which would be the control. Um, and then you would, or you could be put into a group where you are going to be smoking a pack of cigarettes every day. So that would be the experiment group. So there's no, no one sitting there saying, I'm going to, you know, I'm only going to put the men into the smoking group and the women into the non-smoking group. This is completely random. So you're trying to randomize this stuff as much as possible across race, across gender, across age. You're going to put people randomly into all these groups. You have a really large sample size, ideally, because the larger your sample size, the better uh, or more statistically significant your data will be. And so that's the first thing you would do is you would make sure it's randomized. There's no bias or you know, you're not purposely segregating people into specific groups within your experiment. The next part here is that controlled part. So what does controlled mean? And this is really tough. But controlled means that you are basically eliminating other confounding variables. So within your group, let's say, you know, you randomly decided to assign people into a, you're going to smoke a pack every day for the rest of your life group and a group that you're never going to smoke. Um, the confounding variables comes into this picture though, because in that group of people who are the smokers group, maybe they're doing other things with their lives that are putting them at higher risk for lung cancer. And so you're gonna have to make sure that basically the only difference between the smokers and the non-smokers is the fact that the smokers are smoking. And so they have to live in identical worlds for us to really begin to say whether or not this is truly a controlled experiment. Is this possible? <laughs> No, um, but we can do the best we can with what we have and try to rely on as much info as we know about people. So like, how often are you exercising? How, what does your diet look like? You know, there's a bunch of other confounding variables, your genetics. Um, so like if you had identical twins, that would be a great one you could do where one twin would smoke every day and the other twin would not smoke. Um, you know that you'd be controlling for their genetics, but in addition to genetics, there's a lot of other things at play here. So we also have to worry about like, is one of those twins working out a lot and living a really healthy lifestyle and eating really good foods while the other one isn't, you know? And so those are the confounding variables that hopefully in a controlled experiment, you would not have to worry about because they would be living identical lives except for the fact that they're smoking cigarettes or only one of them is smoking cigarettes. 
Um, so that is the very important thing to make note of in terms of how do you even begin to suggest or add credence, add belief to the notion that there is some kind of causal relationship between smoking and lung cancer. And that's the reason why this thing took decades for uh, you know, science to really begin to say like, yes, we can say that we are seeing statistically significant trends here because it takes a lot of work to say whether or not it's the smoking or it's the exercise or it's the food someone's eating or it's their environment because maybe they're next to this chemical plant that's been releasing a bunch of toxins into the air or to the water that the people drink every day. Maybe that's what's causing them to have shorter lifespans or get lung cancer and not the smoking. So, you know, it's really tough to do. Um, and so that's part of the reason why it's it's definitely challenging work. Um, and then finally, what I can say also in terms of, you know, if you're doing an experiment, uh, what helps in addition to all this stuff is looking at the correlations between these two things. Like, do you see a stronger exposure or do you see if a stronger exposure le leads to a stronger response? So how could you do this? So let's take humans out of the picture here. Let's say we're just looking at mice and we're gonna somehow figure out how to make mice smoke or we're just gonna expose them to smoke um, or just that specific group of mice that we want them to be exposed to smoke. Um, and so within these, Within that, you know, yes, you're either a smoker or no, you're not a smoker. You can also do this thing where you see if you have half smokers or quarter smokers. So it's like, instead of smoking one pack per day, what if you only smoked half a pack per day? What if you only smoked a quarter of a pack per day? What if you smoked three quarters of a pack per day? And so by looking at this data, by looking at your mice populations, you can see if you're noticing a trend and ideally if there is a causal relationship here, you would see a positive trend, a linear trend in this direction between these two variables. Um, and that would also help add credence to the notion that there is causal relationship between these two things. So just to wrap things up here, the key thing here with this stuff, and this is part of the reason why like mice are so common in these lab studies is because, you know, we can't ethically take other human beings and force them to smoke and, you know, take their identical twins and force them to not smoke. Um, so we turn to mice, um, but basically we need these things to be randomized. So there's no preference. So you're making sure that your mice are, you know, this everyone in your group, there's no gender preference. There's no racial preference. Ideally with your mice, they would all just be genetically identical. So you could like clone your mice so that, you know, you're controlling for genotypes at least. Um, so you've got sexes controlled, you've got genotypes controlled. And then the only difference between them is going to be that one group is smoking, the other group is not smoking, and then you can also have, you know, half smokers, quarter smokers, all that stuff to have that kind of see if you're seeing that strength of response uh, associated with the strength of stimulus. And so if you're able to do these types of experiments and see that there are positive trends and that, um, you know, it looks good, that's how statistics can begin to tell you that there is this available, this, this is potentially causal and you're going to add credence to this thing. And the way science works is that, you know, you can put a lot of time and money into your experiment, controlling as many variables as you can, and you can publish this data. And then another group out there, maybe they're funded by tobacco is going to come out with a paper that says the exact opposite thing. And, um, you know, that would be called into question and, and people would have to review how they did their stuff too and they would look at how you did your stuff. Um, but basically that paper could be taking away cre credence from this notion that there is that causal relationship. So that's the way in which science works. Um, but fortunately, uh, you know, we do make progress because at the end of the day, science is really just about seeking the truth and discovering the truth. And so um, I'm going to wrap things up with that. But thank you all for watching. I hope this is helpful and I hope everyone out there is doing well. I'll talk to you guys next time.